The next two columns have an odd looking value called multip correction of mixture adaption and beef. Sounds like I'm chewing bubblegum. These are what you'd see in a standard OBD2 scan tool as long-term fuel trim values. The value here very close to one is where the ECU is most happy. And that value would be telling you that the ECU isn't having to do any correction or something is broken and your O2 trims are turned off. When they're off, they're simply stuck at 1.00. So as long as they're a non-zero number, you can be pretty confident they're functioning. A lower value means the system is pulling fuel, or a higher value means it's adding fuel to the base mapping. It's doing this in response to the target lambda, or air fuel value. And the long terms are slowly absorbing the short terms, trying to keep them happier around 1.00 as well. If you see one bank pretty far off from the other, far off being more than 3 or 4%, you'll want to go looking for problems. Bank to bank deviations in the fuel trims like that can come from many things. Dirty fuel injectors, intake manifold leaks, exhaust manifold leaks, improper cam timing, or simply a bad O2 sensor. Retardation cylinder one is the next column over and is referring to the knock adaption value that ECU is applying to cylinder one. Normally you'd want to log retardation cylinder one, retardation cylinder two, retardation cylinder three, and so on up through six to get individual cylinder retard for each cylinder. The COM access port does this well, as does the factory PWIS. However, the Durametric seems to be simply duplicating cylinder one six times. Mm, oops, pretty annoying, and it's been reported so many times I've lost count. However, even the single value gives you an overall picture of the knock retard going on in the engine. Although having all the values does allow you to do individual cylinder knock threshold tuning and a few other fancy things. Generally, you'll want this to be zero, since knock is not our friend. But you tend to see a lot of knock in the sub 2500 RPM range, and typically when you're rolling into and out of the throttle. This is mostly drivetrain noise it's hearing versus actual engine knock, so don't get too scared from that. However, in the higher load and wide open throttle conditions, when you see a bunch of knock like in the example I showed you earlier, you're certainly going to want to lower the boost, decrease the timing, enrich in the mixture, or get a better fuel with higher octane in there or you'll be asking for damage. The actual throttle plate angle is the next column over and is pretty much exactly what it's telling you it is. No hidden agenda here. On some cars, 100% is 100%, while on others, 100% or max throttle angle may be limited to 85. What we're typically looking for here is throttle closure. Since we're dealing with e-throttle cars and the ECU is controlling them based on many, many conditions and not simply where your foot is on the throttle pedal. So if you're at wide open throttle and you suddenly see the actual throttle plate angle closing down, then maybe reopening a few RPMs later, that's usually caused by the ECU sensing something isn't right and putting the engine into a protective mode. Next over are some more fueling values. Fuel trim, mean value, bank one and two. Actual lambda value, bank one and two. The fuel trim mean value, bank one and two, are what you'd normally see called short-term fuel trims in an OBD2 scan tool. A value of 1.00 is telling you that the ECU is not having to trim the fuel from the base mapped values in the tune to maintain the target lambda. Even though we're not logging the target lambda, it is another variable you can look at. The short terms versus long terms we explained earlier are kind of like short term and long term memory. Although I certainly hope that my ECU as it's aging doesn't start losing its short term memory. Jokes aside, the short terms are an immediate value and taking care of the trims to maintain the actual lambda according to the target. And if these are consistently high, the long terms will absorb those values every few seconds to try to keep the short terms closer to 1.0. 
So the short terms move fast and the long terms move slow. The actual lambda values, bank one and bank two, are just that. They're the air fuel ratio or lambda value directly from your wideband O2 sensors. They're telling you the aftermath of all the work the ECU did preparing the fuel calculation for your engine. And now that it's burnt, the O2s are telling you what happened. In the idle and light throttle, you're generally looking for 1.0 lambda value, which is 14.7 to 1 on pump fuel. While at heavier throttle positions or wide open throttle, you'll see it moving downwards, which is a richer condition. A 20% rich condition or 0.8 lambda is a nice target for most turbo engines, where naturally aspirated engines generally target a leaner lambda value since they don't need so much extra fuel to keep things cool down there. And in the last column in our example is another odd looking value. Pressure ahead of third pre per press sensor. Yes, I sound like the Swedish chef on the Muppets. English burn the Swedish meatball. Or simply put, boost. In the 996 and 997.1 turbo, there's only the single map sensor, and they're in front of the throttle plate and not actually in the manifold where the 997.2 turbo and 991 turbos got two sensors, one in the front of the throttle body and another in the intake manifold. These are absolute pressure transducers that read a zero value at absolute vacuum. So at sea level, you'll see 1000 in this column while just turning the key on or sitting at idle. While up in the mountains, it'll only be maybe 800 to 850 since the air pressure is much lower up there. Then if you're running one bar of boost, you'll see a 2000 in this column at sea level, or only 1800 to 1850 up in the mountains of Colorado. So even though you're running one bar, you can see that the absolute pressure is much lower and will have a huge effect on your power up there. You'd actually have to run 1.2 to 1.25 bar up there to even get close to the 2000 at sea level. And even then your power would still be down due to everything having to work so much harder to get there. Now the PWIS and Cobb access port also have a set point or nominal boost value you can log. That combined with the actual boost will show if you're achieving these set points or sometimes exceeding. These values combined with wastegate duty cycle on a 996 turbo and actuator position on a 997 turbo can help dial in your boost control very nicely. That's all the values we had in this particular data log. Even though there are tons more, these are some of the primary ones used for monitoring the overall running condition of your engine and also used to assess your current tune or make adjustments accordingly based on them. Now, be careful since these logs can lie sometimes. That can be rough to distinguish between a bad sensor, intake manifold leak, poorly timed cam, or some hardware issue versus a tuning issue. And sometimes we'll even make revisions while remotely tuning to help diagnose hardware issues. But either way, the data really helps dial your tune in and make sure everything is running perfectly. Do you have any questions? Put your hand up and we'll call on you. Oh, yeah, this is YouTube and we can't see you out there. So make sure to leave a comment if you have a question or would just like to tell us how much you're enjoying these. They do take us a tremendous amount of time to script out, record, edit and produce so with a very minimum please leave us a like thanks for watching